Welcome back, everyone. Talk about Nigerian Correctional Service, the Nigerian Immigration Service, Federal Fire Service, the Nigeria Security and Civil Defense Corps. All of these are under uh, the Minister of Interior. And we're joined by Honorable Minister Olubumi Tunjiojo in the studio tonight. Thank you so much for coming. And um, congratulations on the 25th anniversary of Nigeria's democracy. Uh, let's get to it. Ohanese Indigo named you among its three best performing ministers. I'm sure you've heard of that. No, oh, okay. You're trying to be humble right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me inform you. They commended you for what you, they called the reformative efforts, you know, under your ministry in the past nine months. What do you consider the highlights of your ministry within this period? Well, first of all, let me start by congratulating His Excellency, mm -hmm. President Balak Metinubu, for the one-year anniversary one year of audacious, what I call audacious, bold and tenacious leadership. You know, that's BAT, bold, audacious and tenacious leadership. I know it's been a very hard one, uh, considering uh, tough decisions, you know, that uh, he has had to make. Yeah. So, um, but these are decisions that will, will, will have great impact in, the, in terms of the future of Nigeria. Yeah. So I want to congratulate His Excellency for the anniversary and for his courage as well. And for, for the Ministry of the Interior, the most important thing for us, I always say, was, and it keeps ringing bell, is what the President told us when we were appointed. He said it very clearly, yeah, that uh, I've not appointed you, ministers, to give excuses. You've been appointed to provide solutions to problems. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. So when we came on board, and we had what we call our stock taking, we looked at agencies, under the supervision of the ministry and, of course, the ministry itself. And we saw that there were a lot of things that needed to be done. I'll give you a simple example. When we came on board, we looked at the passport problems that we had in the immigration service. We inherited a backlog of over 204,000 passports. And immediately we, we swung into action. And to the glory of God, we were able to clear that in slightly over two weeks. You know, and since then, the slogan, the mantra became... You initially said two weeks, but you were not able to deliver Yeah, I said the slightly over two, okay. less than three weeks. Okay. You know, we did about two and a half weeks, mm -hmm. less than two. That's why I said slightly over two weeks. We mm -hmm. were able to clear that. And of course, when we weren't able to do it in two weeks, we came and we apologized to Nigerians, mm -hmm. you know, because this government is about giving your word and keeping your word. That's what Mr. President yeah. does, you know. So, basically, we're able to clear that. And we looked at the whole system and we said it's not just enough building a, um, it's not just, it wasn't enough clearing it. What was important was making sure it never happened again. Mm -hmm. Because this government is about building strong institutions. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just about individual, it's about the institution. That's what renewed hope is all about. So after doing that, we automated the system. And like, as I can tell you, we finished with the first phase, the second phase of the whole automa of the automation. And the third phase is what we're going on. In fact, the third phase, we, we, we were ready as far back as on the 8th you know, of, uh, of February, of March. We, we, I mean, we were ready. On, but we realized that there was no data center. You know, we were leveraging on the data center of one of our, of one of our vendors, a private individual. And we thought that, look, for the purpose of national security, we can't do that. So we swung it to action, and I tell you what we have today in the NIS is, uh, I mean, it's a tier 4, 1.4 pentabyte data center, which is the first time in 61 years of NIS that because we handle data of Nigerians, and we are responsible for the sanctity, for the integrity of the data that we handle. So we have been able, to the glory of God, to do that. And also, in, under NIS, we looked at our passage that it takes about five, seven minutes to clear a passenger, you know, and our officers were not equipped with the opportunity of pre-profiling as done abroad. And that alone was a threat to our national security because we, ha we can't profile people before they come mm -hmm. to Nigeria. So we don't, these officers don't have laser. They don't have detectors in their eyes. You know, it was more subjective than objective. And what did, uh, what did we do? We, we, started the whole project of the e-gate which you've just seen mm -hmm. and of course the api pnl solution which has been fully completed and of course the command and control center just two weeks ago ical came you know the representative came all the way from canada and the command and control center was adjudged to be one of the best anywhere in the world mm -hmm. i'm happy because this is what the president keeps telling us do not give nigerians a good solution mm -hmm. give nigerians the best because only the best is good enough 
for Nigeria, you know, and we're happy we've been able to do that. In the area of corrections, mm -hmm. you know, we are, there's so many other things, but border control, visa, passport, or We'll probably okay. touch yes, on that. Let's, let's talk about, you know, yes. as the Minister of Internal mm -hmm. Affairs or Interior, as um, the government puts it now, there's a whole lot under your ministry, including security. And uh, let's look at the National um, Civil um, Defense Corps now. You know, a lot of, we have a lot of security issues in the country, but some people will say that we see the police on the front line protecting lives and property, and they would want to see this um, National Security, Civil Security and Civil Defense Corps step up to the plate to also complement the efforts of the police. We know that um, they do pipeline protections and all of that, but what's being done to improve their capacity to ensure that they do more because there's so much to do? in safeguarding lives and property in Nigeria. Okay, thank you. I listened carefully, you know, because uh, when you look at the, every, every agency, you know, is a product of an establishment strategy. You know, what is the law? Which law really established the agency? What the, the, what's the mandate? And when you look at the mandate of the NSCDC, main mandate, core mandate, is to protect critical national assets. The, the NSCDC was not established to rival the police. It wasn't a game of rivalry. It was a niche was created, critical national asset. In terms of our pipelines, in terms of our power infrastructure, in terms of our telecom infrastructure, in terms of our agricultural, in terms of our solid mineral resources. And one of the first things we've done in collaboration with my in collaboration with the Minister of Solid Minerals, we came up with the mine marshals. Yeah, you know, and today you will agree with me. When last did you even hear of the ugly incident that we used to hear with regards to our minds, you know. Since the mine marshal came, they were trained by the military, equipped, and today they are NSCDC uh, officials, but seconded, of course, to the Ministry of Solid Mineral, because this is about working together. This, that industry has enjoyed a bit of stability, and we hope we can replicate that in other areas. And as I speak to you, more than 800 assets are being protected by the NSCDC as we speak to you. That is what the law says they should do. When I can, I'll give you an, uh, a scenario. I was, there was a day I was in the car by um, a roundabout, a life camp roundabout, and I saw an NSCDC vehicle, and the officials were stopping people in a light, and immediately I, came, I called the CG. I said, no, you can't do this. We have too many critical infrastructure to be protected than you to be talking of in a light. That is not what you're meant to do. So, and secondly, we must also thank Mr. President for this. Mr. President signed the critical uh, in, uh, asset and infrastructure pl um, uh, plan. He signed it into action to give power, you know, to the NSCDC and to domicile the protection of the critical asset. Because Mr. President believes that if police handles what police they're supposed to do, the military handles it, everybody's about division of labor. Mm -hmm. When you do what you're supposed to do, when if I do mine, you do yours, we bring it together, then we'll have a safe plan. Mm -hmm. That's part of the things we've done in um, NSCDC. And I'll also tell you, the private guards, two weeks ago we had a summit, I mean, an interactive session. We are, we've come up, the Federal Security Council approved what we call the guard management system. Because anywhere in the world, you will agree with me that no nation has enough boots on ground to take care of security challenges. Mm -hmm. There are roles, you know, that the private sector must play. And the private guards, the way they're presently, the way the private guards are, you know, they're not playing that role, you know. And part of the reason is the obsolete law, you know, that established the Private uh, Guard Company Act of 1986. We're presently looking into that, you know, to see how we do that. And also to bring confidence to Nigerians. In terms like what I tell people, you employ guards in your homes. It is your, it is your right to know who you employ, you know. Now we are giving that background opportunity to Nigerians. You leave your daughter. You don't want to leave your daughter with a pedophile in mm -hmm. the name of a guard. Mm -hmm. You don't want to leave your wife with a rapist in the name of a guard. So this government is basic, mm -hmm. basically trying to bring all this to fore. And mm -hmm. of course, have biometric details of all these guard companies, re amend the laws, mm -hmm. streamline the process, mm -hmm. enhance efficiency and productivity of the private sector in enhancing their participation in the overall security. Allow me to jump in quickly and discuss, you know, professionalism amongst the personnel um, under your ministry. I know you follow, uh, you must have seen some latest investigative reports alleging uh, fraud and misconduct, you know, within the NIS. Uh, for instance, um, some allegations of corruption, reports of bribery and extortion. What are you doing to clean up that mess as we speak? Well, I'll tell you this. The first thing I always believe is 
um, you have to motivate your officers. You know, motivation is key. And uh, that's part of the things that this administration has been able to do. Um, one of the first things we, uh, Mr. President did was that when we came on board, we inherited backlogs, some oh, yeah. of eight, nine, ten years. A single grade, a single person stagnated. What did Mr. President do? In one day, clean sweep, in one day, over 32,000 personnel were promoted. That was an encouragement. I'll tell you why I'm giving this background, you know. No, secondly, when we had election in Bayesa, we lost two NSCDC officials. When the Correctional Center was attacked in Calabar, we lost an officer. When our, uh, our NIS uh, border post was attacked in Gibia, we lost two officers. And Mr. President said, oh, how about these people? We realized that there was no life assurance. What did Mr. President do? Clean sweep. He approved life assurance policy for these officials. Today, all our officers, they earn what we call the peculiar allowance. It wasn't there before Mr. President came on board. Why am I going through this route? It's for you to understand that if we are not taking action, demanding for the best in a sane manner, it's because this particular administration has given every motivation needed for the officer. It's not that we are demanding for the best when we are giving you the worst. We are demanding for the best in terms of character, in terms of competence, in terms of professionalism, because His Excellency President Bola Ahmed Tinubu has succeeded in motivating, in giving them a condition of service like never before. I can say it emphatically, like never before. So for these officers now, you know, because what are we doing? We have about 16 of them in NIS, for example, because we engage in what we call a mystery shopping, you know, and um, about 16 of them were caught. You know, and today they are going through disciplinary procedure. Of course, there are processes. But what I want to assure you is now we can come up and demand for the best because there is nothing, and I repeat, nothing that officers have asked of this government reasonably that the government has not... Including done. remuneration. Yes, including remuneration, yeah. including allowance, like peculiar allowance, including uh, life assurance policy, so this including promotion because now I'll t give you one story. The board was established in 1986, and for the first time since 1986, under President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, the board started the process, pro uh, promotion exercise for the year and ended it that, ended it that same year. So there is no backlog of promotion. As we are already, we have started the process of 2024 promotion. Yeah, yeah. So when you join a service and you know that this government cares about your progress then the government has every right to demand for the best for let's, them. Let's, let's still talk about um, internal security now. We, the, the government, security agencies have struggled to tame terrorism that has festered for more than a decade now. And some people will say it's because it has assumed a trans-border dimension. A lot of these terrorists cross uh, into Nigeria from the borders or bordering countries mm. to um, attack or launch attacks in the country at soft targets and then go back. And it's because they say our border lines no longer exist. These borders are porous. What are we doing to secure the borders to ensure that we ward off all these external elements that come to constitute security threats in the country? Well, thank you very much. Uh, once again, this particular administration has done a lot in that regard. I was saying something the other time when I was talking about NIS. When it comes to the border security, NIS is the lead agency. Mm -hmm. It's there by law, you know. And an efficient NIS, of course, is an efficient border force because that's the lead agency in that regard. I will tell you the command and control that we built for the air for the airports and the PNIPR, it's it's for border security in terms of our airspace, yeah. in terms of our airports. Yeah. That had been done, completed hundred percent, ready to be commissioned by His Excellency, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu. Number two, in terms of our land border, I wouldn't want to divulge too much because of security cons considerations, but I'll tell you this. Today, there's surveillance in a lot of our border. We have not yet covered everything. Of course, I tell people, Nigeria came together as one, was amalgamated in 1914. President Bola Mentenbu did not become president in 1914. Mm. He became president in 2023. Yeah. That is 109 years mm. after the amalgamation. Mm. So nobody expects him to solve the problem of 109 years in one year. Mm -hmm. But in a reasonable space, I will tell you, we have uh, more than half of our border points now, border posts are automated. There is real-time communication, there is visuals, there is a lot of 
processes going on in terms of surveillance. So the border, e-border surveillance, as I talk to you now, we have finished by, by October, we'll be done with phase one. And the phase one I'm talking about, including our marine border, because, because one of these days, we will invite you to our command and control for mm -hmm. air and sea border. You know, when we just come on air, people just think, oh, this government is about just talking. It's not about that. It's what you can see. The beauty of this administration is that we only tell you what we have done. We, we rarely tell you what we want to do. Not just about what we want to do. It's about what we have done. Oh. So you will see the border space today. It's not mm -hmm. what it used to be. There's real-time communication. Just as I said, this is 2024. This is not 1984. So you cannot secure your border without without technology. Yeah, yeah. That's number one. And number two, you have to know the peculiarity of Nigerian border. The Nigerian border spans terrestrially 4,047 uh, 4, kilometers. And Nigerian borders four countries terrestrially. Two are ECOWAS, two are non-ECOWAS. That tells you how it is. And of course, there are issues of the nation of our border space, especially Nigeria and Benin Republic, you know, Nigeria. So there are a lot of issues, and I believe that the Boundary Commission is working right. on that to be able to... I guess these borders you're talking about are the ones that are official, because there are quite... They say there are many unofficial no, no, borders. No, 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 no. Yes. There's, no there's, not, there's nothing like unofficial border. Mm. Every border is official. I, are you what saying, you can talk about is entry points. Entry point, border points. Exactly you, can the point have, I was you can have unofficial illegal are you entry saying point. I'm this, talking about yes. the span okay. of our border. No, no, the question I'm even raising there is that does government, is government in the know as regards these unofficial entry points? No, definitely. And that's are they why, police? Are they that's man? why technology. All right. Because it's difficult mm. to put boots. Let's be objective. Or to build walls. Or build walls. You okay. understand? Rather than build walls, we are about building bridges. Indeed. We're about connecting people. Okay. But the bottom line mm. is that it's almost impossible for you to put boots on 4,047 kilometers. Honorable right, Minister, we're but running out of time. You can use technology yes. to, yeah. of course. Let us touch that. on um, the issue of you have personally acknowledged overcrowding of our. Correctional centers. Yeah, uh, you know, the walls fell down in Suleja, and they say these buildings have been on for God knows when. Since the colonial era? Since the colonial That's era. Is there a time frame to when this will be fixed? Uh, you talked about relocating even some of these correctional centers. Are we, do we know when this will happen in real time? Okay. Yeah, the beauty of the government, is, of this government, is we don't make open ended promises. We we'll make time-bound promises, you know, because we like to be, I mean, held responsible for what we say. That's what Mr. President stands for. Let me tell you this. When we came on board, the first thing we did was to look at the list of our correctional centers. And we looked at how many people are actually in custody for inability to pay petty fines. At the end of the day, we saw over 4,000, you know, which was 5% of the image. We were able to raise fund about 585 million to pay off these debts. We decongested by 5%. Uh, what that means mathematically is that it saves government of over a billion naira of feeding allowance of those 4,000 people per, uh, per annum. One billion. It's uh, without spending a cup of government, we save government of one billion of feeding allowance. Uh, That's number one. Number two is the fact that we launched what we call the EMIT audits. The people that are in the correctional centers, how many of them are actually supposed to be in the correctional centers? Because that's one thing, apart from human rights factor, it's part of the things leading to the over, um, uh, what's it called, the congestion of our correctional centers. And also, we looked at, we did what we call infrastructural audit. We have 256 correctional centers in Nigeria. Between you and I, you know it is not healthy. The number for government to protect 256 centers. In this era, people build bigger correctional centers, accommodate more people, build courts in these places, and be able to give, make the place correctional reformatory yeah. rather than a prison. A prison is a place of incarceration. A correctional center is a transformative arena where you have to change. The name did not just change in 2019 for the purpose of change of name. The name changed because of the purpose, the ideology behind the setting up of the agency. So what are we doing? There are some of our correctional centers, like the one that fell, that first major, we've not had a jail attack 
under President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, all we had was a jailbreak because it was first major. That prison was, that correctional center was built in 1914 by during the time of Lord Lugard. And that was 110 years. Mm -hmm. But we have, we inherited 256 of right. such correctional centers. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example, Ikoi, popular Ikoi corrections. It was built in 1955. Mm -hmm. yes, so, yes, 1955. As at that time, maybe it was an isolated place. But today, it borders uh, a polo club and etc. And we know what the, what the law says, that no correctional center, every correctional center that should have a buffer of 100 meters. You don't have that in Ikoyi, for example. Mm. So what is a correctional center doing in Ikoyi for crying out loud? So there is there's need for us to relocate some of these correctional centers right. because of the effect of urbanization, and not just urbanization, because of the effect of national security. The correctional center that wall that came down in Suleja mm. has a buffer of just seven meters to the next house. Mm. So if there is a jailbreak, it's easy for these people to be... Honorable this though, I'm afraid we have to leave now, um, but I wanted to ask something direct. Is this relocation possible in the lifetime of this administration? In well, four years, well, in thirty seconds. Well, what I will assure you yes. is, we will do everything possible. We All can't right. do. We need. We have twenty nine correctional centers All right. that needs to be relocated. Of okay. course, we can't do twenty nine. But even if we do one, two, three, at mm. least a journey of a million miles. You know, it not is. just a thousand miles. If a million miles it starts with a single. Thank story. you, Honourable Minister, for joining us on the program today. Thank you. Olubuwe Tundio is the Honourable Minister uh, for Interior. We're going to bring you uh, a documentary now from the office of the personal assistance to the president on videography i understand that this has to do with um, the administration yes the administration of um, president bola tinobu mm -hmm. his first year in office this documentary is tagged president tinobu a decisive leader <laughs> 